So, um, yeah, basically, thanks for having me here. And uh, today's presentation, it's called Lifting the Veil on Financial Secrecy and Tax Haven, where um, I'll be presenting the work of the Tax Justice Network. So what we are going to see today is um, financial secrecy. So what it is, um, why we care about it, who are the enablers, uh, who is benefiting from it, but most importantly, how do we tackle it, which is also where our work focus. Um, let me give you a definition of financial secrecy, which refers to the use of complex financial mechanisms by wealthy individuals, multinational corporations and criminals to hide their assets for the purpose of abusing tax or evading the rule of law. Uh, and how does it look in practice? Uh, as you probably know very well, wealthy oligarchs, criminals and looters have increasingly been paying lawyers, accountants and bankers to set up secrecy vehicles such as sorry, trusts, foundations and shell companies to hide their ownership of all sorts of assets from the forces of law, from our tax authorities and uh, from the societies in which they live. So this creates a problem because it basically creates two rules of law, one uh, for the elites, one for the powerful and rich for high net individuals and corporations who have the resources to access this system and uh, another law for everybody else. So um, this does not result, uh, result only in tax evasion alone, but it uh, goes way beyond that. Uh, it allows to avoid uh, any sort of uh, limitation at home, sort of um, contract kickbacks uh, or avoiding disclosure of interest, of conflict of interest and any other of I mean, in general, it just allows you to escape the rule of law at home, way beyond tax. So we like to describe the role uh, of tax in our, sorry, in our systems um, as with the four R's of tax, taxation, which are revenue, redistribution, repricing and representation. So in that sense, uh, tax abuse not only undermines revenue collection, but also undermines redistribution. Uh, it threatens the social contract, so representation, and affects the effectiveness of uh, the reprising function of tax. So um, to give you a sense of uh, the forms in which <laughs> secrecy can take um, in, this is in the global north, uh, specifically in Italy. Um, we can say that, um, when I say that uh, secrecy allows you to escape the rule of law way beyond tax, we mean that um, the, the damages that it can cause goes way beyond the underpayment of tax, such as in this case, um, this is, uh, from, this is an investigation emerged from the ICAJ Pandora Papers uh, where this um, chemical and plastic producer uh, from Belgium, like this Solvay multinational from Belgium, uh, had a plant uh, in Italy, in the northern town of Spinetta Marengo. And um, uh, the plant was releasing uh, toxic waste uh, 40 times the allowed limit in the wells nearby and this had um, a lot of uh, consequences for uh, the health of the people involved such as uh, workers developed cancer, uh, kids living nearby developed uh, neurological disease and uh, a study found that people living within two miles from the plant uh, were 30% more likely to um, develop diseases such as leukemia, Parkinson's disease, cancer, kidney cancer, I think. And so this is very tangible. Uh, and um, so eventually the Italian prosecutor brought charges against the, uh, the, the management of the, of, the, of the firm because they were urged to clean up the site and they intentionally failed to do so. So eventually the Italian prosecutor uh, brought charges against them and uh, from the Pandora Papers we see that these people here um, from the management, uh, they moved assets just before this started. 
They moved 50 million USD assets in trusts in New Zealand and Singapore. So you can understand from here that even if the case would have gone forward, uh, there would have been nothing left there. So um, yeah, that's sort of a problem. But uh, if, these are if these are the effects in the global north, let's see what happens in the global south as there the consequences are even more harsh. Um, illicit financial flows undermine development in Global South and tackling them is a matter of survival for Africa's development, which must be treated with urgency. There is broad consensus that uh, the funds being bled out of Africa could be channeled toward, uh, channeled toward the continent's development if successfully retained. In general, we can say that the incentives and the ability to pursue illicit financial flows through the mechanism available outweigh the type of mechanism that lead you to a powerful, representative, effective state that can start to deliver development. So um, this is from 2015. Um, because the question that we have, we have been asking is if corruption is actually the main issue here, um, so if uh, Africa's underdevelopment is really just due to corruption and uh, studies find that not really. So in 2015, uh, when the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa High Level Panel on Illicit Financial Flows was released, um, I mean, when they released their report, uh, this became a cornerstone, a cornerstone document that marked the history of Africa's justice movement, capturing attention at a global scale. The report presents a comprehensive analysis of the forms in which the results drain of course, and findings are that only 5% of illicit financial flows take the form of corruption, while 60% are constituted by commercial activities, such as transfer pricing, and 30% by criminal activities such as trade mispricing. Um, so, uh, in fact, there is hard evidence that contrary to what we have been told for decades, Africa is a net creditor to the world. While we talk of the sustainable development goals, we should bear in mind that uh, development does not come in a vacuum and needs uh, financing. So beyond the, mm, beyond the narrative as Africa as the receiving end of aid, we believe we should look elsewhere, specifically at illicit financial flows, which cause a hemorrhagic of resources from the continent that if retained would be at the disposal of local governments for development and would grant the, con the continent independence from external aid. According to UNCTAD, losses uh, are 88.6 billion uh, a year, and uh, according to our State of Tax Justice report uh, released in 2021, which you will see just show the tip of the iceberg, tax revenue loss amount to 17.1 billion. And the, a study from uh, Ndikomana and Boys from the Perry Institute report uh, that in the years between 1970 and 2015, uh, the money lost in capital flights uh, amounts to US dollar 1.4 trillion, and this uh, number vastly exceeds uh, the stock of the external debt de of the external debt of these countries plus all the aid they received in all these years combined. So um, yeah, that's why we really look at illicit financial flows um, as the real problem and not just. We don't believe aid uh, can really start to deliver development uh, anywhere. So, uh, in developing countries, uh, the offshore system of tax havens has facilitated the looting of their countries by their elites. But the question is, uh, where does the money go? Because um, it takes two to tango. So, uh, in 2009, uh, we asked this and uh, we set up the Financial Secrecy Index to identify the most important recipients of looted money. So the idea was to create an antidote to widespread corruption rankings, such as Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, which identified poor, mostly African countries as the most corrupt, while ignoring those rich world countries that were welcoming all the stolen funds. 
of, yeah, here you can see a comparison between the two. They look, look quite different. Um, so um, we should um, keep in mind that there is a twofold dimension of illicit financial flows. Um, while you'll see from the result of the research that the money flows into some of the richest countries in the world, further exacerbating existing inequalities and undermining development in the global south, th this is not it, because uh, these flows are also threatening uh, the democracy at the receiving end of them. Uh, and this is happening in many ways. So, um, as they, these flows entails a wide uh, range of um, not very nice side effects. One of them uh, being uh, what we call the finance course. Um, basically, the rampant use of tax havens had this effect to um, uh, made the, led to the financializations of the economies. Uh, the, this happens, this is very much the case of Britain, for example. This uh, happens when the fina financial sector grows beyond a useful size and begins to arm the economy that hosts it. Uh, it shifts resources away from what creates jobs and goods, from, so from the real economy and move it toward the creation of increasingly complex and risky financial structures that extract wealth into tax havens. Another uh, very prominent right now uh, argument against the opacity of the laws we have in our countries is the inability to sanction. So uh, financial secrecy has recently raised to the top of priorities following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, started in February. At the wake of the war, governments in Europe and the US started to claim the will to sanction oligarchs as a deterrent to the escalation of violence. But in this context, it has been very clear to us that the failure to set up transparency measures that we have been calling for years has turned against these same governments that sort of tights their own ends. Um, in fact, they're not in a position to uh, enforce sanction because basically we don't know where this wealth is. Loopholes in transparency laws make it impossible for, gover for governments to know who owns what and therefore um, where the money that is financing the war is. According to Zuckman uh, and his colleagues at the EU Tax Observatory, um, 60 percent of the wealth of Russia's richest households, this is the 0.01 percent uh, richest um, household, is held offshore. So this gives you the measure that although welcome the seizure of a couple of yachts may not uh, deliver the uh, results we hoped. Um, so. Um, just to give you a sense of the, of the scale of the problem, there is more wealth hidden offshore beyond the rule of law than there are US dollars and euros changing hands today, more than twice. So to understand the phenomenon and to uh, find ways to tackle it, we developed some tools at the Tax Justice Network we have um, four different work streams. These are the Financial Secrecy Index, the Corporate Tax Haven Index, the State of Tax Justice, and the Licit Financial Flows Vulnerability Tracker. So I'll give a word on each of them, but I'll mostly focus on the Financial Secrecy Index that was released uh, in May, last May. Uh, but to put things in context, I'll start with the state of tax justice, um, the state of tax justice, which is we, we use it mostly as an advocacy tool because um, it's also the moment in which we reach the greatest media coverage, and uh, we use it to make it clear for people to understand <coughs> that these topics do not take place in a vacuum, but that they have tangible effects on all of us and on our lives. So in the first year of the pandemic, we compared tax losses. This is an estimation evaluation of tax losses um, due to corporate and high net worth individuals tax abuse. 
In 2020, we released our first edition of the report and we compared it with the, we compared it with the uh, nurses' salaries. So how many uh, uh, nurses you could have hired if it wasn't for tax losses. And last year, this November, we compared to the vaccines because it was a moment in which there was a lot of debate. I mean, there still is, but there was a lot of debate on uh, lack of ac access to vaccine, especially in the global south. So uh, we found that ta the tax loss, uh, with the tax uh, recovered, we could have uh, vaccinated the world uh, entire population three times over. So now I'll I let speak my colleague Naomi, that will present the um, the figures that emerged from the state of tax justice. So to give an extent, to give a image of the extent of the problem. So. Every year, at least $483 billion is lost to international corporate and private tax abuse. That's $171 billion in private tax evasion and $312 billion due to corporate profit shifting. Sounds like a lot, right? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Let's take a look at corporate profit shifting. The Tax Justice Network uses new OECD data on the accounts of the largest multinationals reporting on each country they do business. If we made all multinationals report their business in each country they operate, we'd capture even more economic activity and add that to the pile of revenue lost. What else is missing from that figure of unpaid tax revenue? There are also loads of indirect effects of the race to the bottom in corporate taxation around the world. These indirect effects mean the tax losses to corporate profit shifting is four to six times bigger. So in reality, the level of tax revenue lost to us by corporate profit shifting is actually much larger. And what about offshore tax evasion by wealthy individuals? The Tax Justice Network's estimate of $171 billion is based on new data from the Bank of International Settlements. Previous estimates by experts James Henry and Gabriel Zuckman put the tax losses at $190 billion. But Zuckman's estimates only consider the financial assets held offshore. When James Henry looked at the full range of financial and non-financial assets, he found it was three to four times bigger. And that's without even considering purely domestic tax abuse. That's the tax lost within countries rather than across borders. So, for now, the State of Tax Justice report estimate of $483 billion lost to international corporate and private tax abuse only represents the tax losses we can see directly. These figures imply that overall, global revenue losses are actually way more than a trillion dollars a year. But those are just the tax losses. The underlying illicit financial flows, money that's being moved opaquely for tax abuse and other corrupt purposes, are much bigger. Our analysis shows the largest multinationals alone are shifting more than a trillion dollars of profits a year, while individuals' offshore holdings due to illicit flows exceed 11 trillion dollars. When governments finally give us proper transparency, the Tax Justice Network will be able to show the full picture for all of these revenue losses in each country. But for now, you can find all the available details for your country, the share of the 483 billion you're losing each year, and the level of damage your country may be inflicting on others in the State of Tax Justice report. Well, so um, now that we have a figure of the losses we are experiencing, we are experiencing. Um, this raises the question of what a tax haven is. 
because uh, for years we have been told that attack seven looked like the um, island with the palm but uh, we are collecting evidence that actually attack seven and attack seven looks a lot more like the image on the right so um, let me start by saying that um, to answer this question, what is, uh, what it is attack seven, we have developed two different tools that are complementary to each other. The Financial Secrecy Index focuses on jurisdictions enabling individuals escaping the rule of law, while the Corporate Tax Seven Index uh, does the same for corporations. So it uh, allows to identify uh, jurisdictions that are enabling corporations to underpay their corporate tax, uh, their corporate income tax, and to escape liability um, in a broader sense as well. Um, however, it must be it must be kept in mind that uh, the distinction is not always sharp, and that the figure blurs together. As in the real world, individuals and corporations are linked, so the indices measure two sides of the same coin. Um, the f how do we get to the? How do we calculate the index? We have to measure one, two measures, one qualitative and one quantitative. The qualitative measure is the secrecy score, which is, a, is an assessment of the legal framework. So basically, how transparent um, the laws of a jurisdiction are, and the global scale weight, which is uh, the the size of the financial market for non-residents. Um, which makes the index very different from a blacklist because we take into account the global scale weight. So it's the, the share of the market that that jurisdiction has at a global level for um, the offshore market, of course. So it may be the case that countries with very secretive, secretive laws do not necessarily play an important role in enabling abuse as is the case for the, Ma for the Maldives, for example, that have very secretive laws, but is not an, an, import, uh, an important offshore destination. So you'll find the Maldives at the end of the ranking, while countries with a moderate, moderately secretive laws, uh, like Luxembourg, that, have, uh, that are a huge offshore destination, will certainly rank uh, more on top. Uh, why do we... Why do we calculate the index? Because by telling us who's enabling dirty money, the index tells us who's responsible to fix the problem of illicit financial flows at the global level. But it also tells us what measures countries should implement to protect themselves from the damages posed by illicit financial flows. Um, so last year in December, uh, the United States Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen said that there's a good argument that right now the best place to hide and launder ill-gotten gains is actually the United States. And uh, this was uh, really not a surprise to us because we, we have been in fact been telling this for a while. Um, this year's edition of the index puts the U.S. in the fourth place of the ranking, confirming that the U.S. is the largest supplier of financial secrecy to the world, providing twice the financial secrecy of the second largest supplier, which is Switzerland. In general, uh, the global picture is that uh, the supply of financial secrecy services, like those utilized by Russian oligarchs, tax evaders, and corrupt politicians has continued to decrease globally due to transparency reforms. But there are five of the G7 countries that are responsible for cutting global progress against financial secrecy by more than half. These countries being the US, the UK, Japan, Germany, and Italy. So, um, as I said, the U.S. Topped the, in topped the index and has increased its role as a global provider of financial secrecy since the previous edition, mainly for two reasons. It worsened the secrecy score, but it also increased its global scale weight. Hence, the volume of financial services it provides to non-residents by 21%. So this is at odds with President Biden's commitment to make transparency one of the pillars of his foreign policy. 
If, on the one hand, it's true that the US adopted a historic transparency law in 2021 um, that requires the beneficial owners of corporations to be identified and registered, this law is full of loopholes, which didn't allow a significant improvement in the secrecy score. Um, so yeah, and a big part of the story of why the US is considered a secrecy capital is due to its refusal, to the US uh, refusal to uh, reciprocally exchange information with other countries' tax authorities. Um, today, more than 100 countries impl are implementing the international standard that uh, requires this sharing of information. And the US is the only major economy that does not participate in this. Another uh, major enabler of financial secrecy uh, is what we call the UK spider's web. Um, in fact, the British overseas territories and crown dependencies are widely used as satellite jurisdictions that facilitate profit shifting and illicit financial flows. Although formally independent, these territories are controlled from the city of London. Um, why? Because the UK has full powers to impose or veto lawmaking in these overseas territories and it has also the power to appoint some key government officials and so on. So the degree of control is very important, it's huge. However, the geographical distance allows the UK to enable secrecy offshore while maintaining more uh, reputable uh, transparency standards um, at home. According to the Financial Secrecy 2022, if taken as a collective, the British overseas uh, I mean the British overseas territories plus the UK are still uh, the biggest enabler, also more than the US. Um, so uh, now this, sec this section here is designed to give you a taste of the rich information which is produced in the index and that can help put investigation and stories in context. So I selected these three topics that uh, are some of the topics that we assess in the index, namely automatic exchange of information, beneficial ownership transparency and the concept of the trust. So um, here on the right, this is a screenshot of our of the Financial Secrecy Index website. Here on the right, uh, you can see the secrecy indicators because, as I said, uh, the laws are assessed, the transparency of the laws is assessed against 20 indicators. So we have, and each of these indicators are sub, sub indicators. So uh, you can go on the website and see all the results. Here you have you know, the secrecy indicator and then the sub indicators, which is what we are assessing, the answer, the notes, which is why we are assessing a country in a certain way, and sources, of course. Um, this is just the, the, the 20 indicators, so a global picture of what we assess, what we consider to be important aspects of financial secrecy. And um, so here I'll give a word of one of these things that um, I think are, it's very important to understand in order to understand how financial secrecy works. And this is automatic exchange of information. So um, automatic exchange of information is a data sharing practice in which a country takes information it has on the financial activity of individuals and businesses who are operating within its borders, but that are resident in another country. And then they share the information with the tax authorities of that country. So uh, this data sharing practice prevents corporations and individuals from abusing bank accounts uh, they hold abroad to hide their value of their wealth and pay less tax than they should at home. In 2020, in 2020, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development recognized that through automatic exchange of information, it succeeded to bring transparency to over uh, 11 trillion uh, US dollars in wealth and assets that were previously hidden. This is also a transparency measure we have been asking for years. Um, in the case of uh, the US, as I said, this is a big part of the story of why the US tops the ranking, because the US today still refuses to implement this standard 
and that's a no-brainer really. Um, another topic that probably you are already, you have some knowledge on, is beneficial uh, ownership, transparency. So uh, the beneficial owner is the natural person who, who ultimately owns or controls an interest in a legal entity or arrangement such as a company, a trust or a foundation. So not always the beneficial owner is the same person that is registered as the legal owner. Uh, the legal owner is the owner on the record. But it can be the case that this person legally registered as the owner holds the interest for someone else. Holds, the, holds that position in the interest of someone else, which is in this case this is acting as a nominee. Mm -hmm. uh, so because it is important to know who is the real person behind the legal vehicle, we require that in addition to the legal owners, also the beneficial owners are identified and registered. So however, once registration is in place, this is not enough. It's just the first step because um, we look at uh, other things as, as well, such as uh, we check if all legal vehicles are covered. So if not only beneficial owners of companies are requested to register, but also of trusts, of foundation, of partnerships. And if there are exceptions, so mm, very often there is, for example, like not all, sorry, all, all kind of companies available in the jurisdictions are requested to register. So that's not okay for us because, of course, uh, who wants to hide will choose the exempted vehicle, the exempted uh, company. Then uh, the information must be updated at least once a year for us, for our standards. But before that, we check if beer shares are available in the country. So beer shares are uh, basically our shares that are objects. Um, and they give ownership, they pro if, you have, if you just hold it, you, you have the ownership. So you cannot register that because you never know, like you, even if you immobilize, even if you register one day, you, you cannot update if this object has been given to someone else. So of course we first uh, check if beer shares av uh, are available in that jurisdiction. In this case, we consider the information cannot be updated. And then we also check if the jurisdiction requires that information is updated once a year at least. Another thing we look at is the threshold that triggers registration. So the, most, the best case scenario is when all shareholders have to register, but uh, it's not usually the case. Um, in the Europea European Union, uh, the threshold is 25%, which is sort of a high threshold because you can split the ownership between more um, shareholders and avoid disclosure, but uh, I mean, it's a start. But the lower, the better. So we are advocating for all shareholders to register their beneficial owners. And then, of course, uh, we check if there are sanctions. So um, if, if, the, if the legislation is enforced through effective sanctions, um, okay, so that was beneficial ownership. And this is the third topic I am um, treating today, which is the trusts. Uh, in fact, there is hard evidence that trusts are heavily used for all sorts of abuse that go, again, way beyond tax evasion. The Pandora Papers, for example, contains loads of information on, on trust abuse which is why we refer to it as weapons of massive injustice. Um, oh, if you want insights on how the world of trust works and, st and stories of trust used by wealth individual in wealth management, I warmly suggest you the Brooke Arrington's bestseller, which is called Capital Without Borders, was a, a whole section on the use of trust for the administration of wealth of high net worth individual. This is super interesting. Um, so, uh, what are trusts? Um, these trusts are really at the core of how secrecy work and are also assessed in the index. So, um, these are legal arrangements in which a settler gives assets to a trustee. 
uh, who holds and manages the asset in favor of a beneficiary. The use of trusts is particularly prone to abuse, given the opacity that jurisdictions allow to these structures. In fact, in most jurisdictions, trusts to come into existence don't even have to register anywhere. So you won't have knowledge that a trust exists or not. And even when they do, when they are required to register, uh, only the trustee is sometimes required to register and to be identified. So you won't uh, ever see the identity of the settler and the beneficiaries that remain secret. Also, another reason why they're so abused is that uh, because the trust is an arrangement, it's not a legal vehicle, so it's sort of a contract. So they don't have legal personality, so they, um, they cannot own an asset. And this means that they cannot be sued and go bankrupt, unlike a company, for example. So if the trust does not own an asset, who does? It's very complicated. It sort of creates an ownership limbo. But um, yeah, so um, this is highly problematic. And um, this is just highly problematic and they're widely abused. So of course we are advocating for the trust to be at least registered to in order to be recognized. Because uh, what happens today is that in many jurisdictions they do recognize trusts once they are, I mean, they can, they can be enforced if there is an issue or, you know, if they just want to give an effect to the trust, to the contract they have, they can do that. So the law recognizes that, but uh, without previous registration. So before that, you won't even know that these trusts exist. And this is very, um, I mean, that's highly problematic for transparency. And that's, I mean, I think it's obvious. So um, what is the impact of secrecy on all of us? Um, secrecy and complexity allow governments to be penetrated by big banks and accountancy firms. This system deprives people of opportunities to have healthcare, education, security, justice, and essentially a fulfilling life. So, and also, while the rest of us is accountable, elites are not. Um, and it's very important to stress that this is not a few exceptions, it's very much how the system works in general, as a rule. So, um, I presented the Financial Secrecy Index um, that was launched last May 17. Uh, but this is not all because we also have other tools, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, such as the Corporate Tax Haven Index, which complements the Financial Secrecy Index, but looks at transparency from a corporate perspective. You may remember that the debate that was launched um, on the global minimum tax rate that followed the scandals of all the Amazons and Googles that did not, did not uh, pay tax and in the countries where they operate. So um, when Biden became president in the United States, this whole debate on a global minimum tax started. And uh, however, tax justice campaigners are not happy with it because it will uh, increase inequalities between global south and global north, but I'm not going to delve into this terrain. But um, so yeah, uh, because of that, um, to come back to our indices, the Corporate Tax Seven Index highlights uh, the countries that are um, enabling this very talked about uh, abuse. And this is the top 10 of last year, CTHI. As I said, they are biannual, so we're going to publish the new Corporate Tax Seven Index next year, and this was from last year. As you can see, the US is not playing a big role here, but the UK is still very present also in this. I mean, it never misses an opportunity. But uh, yeah. Um, so this is what uh, we look at. So the 20 indicators that we use as benchmarks to assess transparency. Just to give you a taste, for example, you'll see unilateral cross-border tax rulings of the kind revealed by the Lux Lake back in, I think, what, 2014? and a lot more other measures that we check to see if the country is enabling this sort of abuse. So the heart of the problem, we believe, lies in the ways international tax rules in a globalized economy take place. Because to date, 
the decisions uh, of international tax rules and standards are taken within the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And this is not an inclusive forum. It's just, we refer to it as a club of rich countries. It's just the richest economy, basically, basically that are part of this OECD. So um, it's not just like that now, it has been like that for 100 years and this is the result. So um, although the OECD has recognized that international tax rules do not work, it has failed to deliver significant, significant change. It must be noted um, that among the OECD members, there are some of the main responsible for the problems outlined so far. We are well aware that the United Nations has its problems, but we believe that uh, every point of departure should be an inclusive forum where all jurisdictions participate on an equal footing. Uh, for example, African leaders do not have uh, a voice in settling international tax rules. And um, this is why some uh, African ministers of finance have called for the United, the United Nations to begin negotiation on an international convention on tax matters, because really it's time. Um, just, I am pretty much done. I just um, want to present our last tool, which is called Illicit Financial Flows Vulnerability Tracker. Um, I don't have the time to dig into this story now, but just to say it exists and was designed to track which channels and which partners are most prone to illicit financial flows risks. So if you take a country, um, in this case I think I took Algeria, uh, you can check who are the partners that um, are, are at risk of causing uh, illicit financial flows. Um, for example, you can take uh, experts and check which countries um, are enabling illicit, which partner countries are enabling illicit financial flows. I think in this case, uh, Italy is the first um, partner for experts. But yeah, basically it's, it's a lot to study, but it exists and you're encouraged to, to check that. Um, our tools can help put into context why individuals and companies use particular jurisdictions or legal entities to hide money, assets and activity. Uh, they display where countries may be at risk and how much they lose to tax abuse and they demonstrate that change is possible and particularly for the need to shift the power from the OECD to the UN for setting international tax rules. So. Yeah, <laughs> this is pretty much it. We have uh, a podcast, a monthly podcast. Um, these, these are just screenshots I took from the website. You can check, we have country profiles, so for every country you can go there and see how much your country is losing, how much your country is um, enabling um, the, the tax losses and the, the score on, the, on all the indexes and so on. Uh, yeah, then there is the vulnerability trackers, all the events, and yeah, that's our work. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, first, I encourage you to reach out uh, after because but we have colleagues, especially we have a training on beneficial ownership. Then we have many events. Uh, and also the, there is a lot of interactive tools. So uh, from there, of course, like there are very complex uh, subjects. So in one hour, I could not cover in detail everything. It's, this is just a taste. But uh, from the website, we have interactive maps that are very, you know, visual. You can, they can be visualized, also the index has all the infographics and the notes, uh, everything. And then you're also very encouraged to reach out to us if you have specific questions or if you have you know, a curiosity, we are all very keen to share the findings. So.
Yeah, I definitely agree with that. As I said, there is this book which I really encourage you to read because it's amazing. It's a bestseller from Brooke Harrington, which is called Capital Without Borders. And it really shows you how this is the rule. Trusts are used for all sorts of, you know, just to manage their assets. It's not just um, abuse, tax abuse or things like that. They just, they just use them to manage their assets. And it's very much the rule. So it's very interesting. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that's a question that requires some thinking, but um, basically you can see that um, what we tend to see here is uh, measures that countries implement, for example, to attract uh, companies. And we can see that many, many countries in Africa, they uh, have redundant tax incentives. So they start, to, they try to attract, to attract, um, you say attract? Yeah. Sorry for <laughs> my English. Um, companies on extractives, but actually they're just losing out because these companies do not really look at incentives. They just take the benefit of it, but you're not going to invest in a country that has no rule of law just because it's offering you an incentives, which means like tax exemptions for 10 years. So what it happens is that this country is just losing so much with no reason. Um, and yeah, then of course there's very complex structures. There's an array of, um, of techniques that uh, they use. So for example, uh, the Netherlands is used for uh, intellectual property, um, you know, and there's a, the, the very um, absurd thing is that there's a really an a army of white collars <laughs> that are even always trying to keep up the work and find new ways. So it's very complex. Mm -hmm. They really set up structures uh, yeah, in a very complex manner. So yeah, I, I don't have, not sure if I feel confident to you know, make a statement on how they do that. But like there's, there are some patterns, of course. So yeah. Definitely. In fact, regarding to this, to go back to the global minimum tax, and that's why we are advocating for the UN to take a lead on this, because to date, the rules, the standards are set at the OECD. But the OECD is not an inclusive forum, because countries that are causing the problem, such as, for example, all the ones you have seen, they're also the ones that are making the rules. So uh, there are really injustices in the system, how it works and how the rules are set out. And in the case of when Biden uh, last year claimed he wanted to do this global minimum tax and so on, uh, we have seen um, that the way it was designed, it was very uneven because uh, the, 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 the tax, because it would, like, this was a 15% tax, uh, corporate income tax, like a standard one. This means that if a multinational that um, is resident in Italy, let's say, goes to Ghana and doesn't pay at least 15%, the, the marginal difference is paid somewhere. So it's paid, any, any, it's paid anyway. So this is going to um, make tax havens useless because you're always going to pay 15. But then we were looking at who gets the 15. And that's why tax campaigners are really not tax justice campaigners are really not happen, happy with that because the 15, the left 15 would have gone not at the source country, so not in the country where these countries, uh, these companies in, is actually operating, but to the resident to the resident country, which means because um, multinationals are mainly from you know U.S., Europe, China, the the margin like the difference would have gone not to the south, global south but to the global north. So you see how problematic this is because this is just going to exacerbate already existing inequality. So we talk, a lot, we talk a lot about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. We talk a lot about aid. But as you can see, like, you know, this, the Indigoman and Boys um, estimate that I showed before, like aid is nothing compared, what, compared to what Africa is losing. So it's just the rules are so unfair and if this, if the governments that are losing out do not have a say in how the 
rules are set, then, I mean, that's highly problematic, we think. Um, the thing is with public, com public CBCR, public country by country reporting, it's a standard that requires every company that is operating in many countries to, rep to disclose what they pay, I mean, how they contribute to each country. So through public country by country reporting, somehow companies have to declare how they're contributing. So you, you can see through it how much a multinational corporation is paying in tax, how many people it hires, uh, you know, all the exemptions or the incentives it takes, all the, you know, how it, basically how it contributes, because these companies really take advantage of the tax system, of all the infrastructures that are built with our taxes, so they, they have a win, right, from there. So with public country by country reporting, these companies are required to disclose country by country and not aggregated. But also there you can see that, yeah, there are some challenges. I mean, we still are not happy with the way public country by country reporting was delivered in the European Union. But again, in the end, what happened is that these multinational corp companies are only with the new law in and with the new accounting directive from 2021, these uh, company only have to disclose on a country by country basis in Europe and not in the 75% of the rest of the world. So again, there are challenges. Governments are not, you know, so in power of everything, but you can see how not fair this is also there because, you know, uh, yeah, in the end, uh, really governments in the global south really don't have a say in how the rules are made. So that's highly problematic. So. Thanks so much. And uh, if you have interests, questions, you really are encouraged to reach out to me or my colleagues. And that's it. So thanks for attending.